My name is Stephen Thomas Story. You may have been with us for the last hour. We're going to continue where we left off and we're going to do some training. It's introductory. There's much more detail behind this in the manual in the back and I do hope that you'll pick one up. We're asking a donation of $25 rather than the $50 amount we usually ask just for a conference special. Uh, we hope that uh, you'll, you'll take that home with you. It contains a lot of what we'll talk about here and in greater depth. This is a, a very important program with Zion Life Foundation and Seven Pillars Foundation that we're working on. Again, oh, oops, I got to get through this. I took it up to the top. It started from the beginning. One second. There we go. This formula right here is actually the formula for a new millennial lifestyle, a universal plan. It's basic. It's something that we can live today in a personal life or in a marriage or in a family. It's something that we can live as a community. The formula can apply to government as well. It doesn't matter what relationship. This formula essentially is our basic goal. That's what we want to work toward in everything we do for all relationships. To love each other. We've got to trust each other. You can love someone you can't trust, but you can't cooperate if you can't trust them, can you? It falls apart. So you must trust and you must also cooperate together before you can begin to produce something good to come out of it. Hopefully we're going to produce ever increasing abundance. And for what purpose? See, the purpose behind the whole thing has to be correct. It's got to be the same. It's got to be the purpose of helping each other, not just helping myself alone. The purpose has to be for the whole. And then the whole has to have a purpose of helping every individual as well. And it's got to be voluntary. What has been wrong with communism, socialism, nationalism, <laughs> and so forth? What's been wrong with that? In all of history, for thousands of years, what's been wrong with it? It is forced on the people by others who want power, prestige, control over the masses, <laughs> and they want fame and glory. Their motives are all wrong. It's all wrong. And that's why it never works. In its own time, it collapses. In its own time, it falls in its face. We can look at our own country right now, the American experiment. American experiment is beautiful. It's a marvelous experiment. How's it going? It's flunking. <laughs> We're having a tough time in these days. We're in the last days. If, you, if you're scripturally, spiritually mo motivated, if you are familiar with prophecies of the Old Testament about the last days, we're in them, okay? <laughs> we're in them right now. It doesn't matter whether you're Christian or Buddhist or, or Jain or whether you're uh, a, a Muslim or a Jew. It doesn't matter. Everyone around the world looks at these times that we're in as times of great strife, great uh, prophecy. They've all been looking forward to a time when we would have marvelous, marvelous afflictions and tribulations to come upon all people. We're in those times already. When they look at the times when the great plagues would, would be across the earth among mankind. We already have great plagues in the earth today that are affecting almost all of the people in the earth. Plague of pornography is one of them. It is one of the worst plagues we could ever face in all of the earth it's worth, worse than bubonic plague. It's worse than those that take populations by thousands because this is taking them by billions. This is a plague already flooding the earth. What about the plague of dishonesty? Is that a plague? It is. It's a spiritual plague. How many, many people does it affect in the world today? Everybody. Ah, oh my heavens, everyone. In fact, it affects them more than they realize. More than they really know. This formula of love, trust, and cooperation is based on truth. Honesty. We have to trust each other. I can love my enemy, but I can't work with him. I can't cooperate with him if we can't trust each other. We can't accomplish what we need. We can't have common vision common goals, common motivations. They don't exist so we can't cooperate. So we have to have this combination before we're going to be able to move forward. We have to live a lifestyle of pure love which expresses unconditional equality of human value. Everyone. It doesn't matter whether we're Christian or Jew or Hindu or Sikh, Muslim. It doesn't matter. 
we have to have equality of human value. No matter what color, red, white, blue, brown, <laughs> almond skin, white skin, black skin, doesn't matter. Equal human value. Trust, we have to have worthy trust. You can't just trust automatically. You can, you can try, but if a person doesn't live up to it, doesn't make it worthy of it, you're, you're not going to do it. It has to require honest, effective communication and common vision. Honesty is the first one on the list. If we're not honest, we can't trust. Period. We have to communicate properly or we can't get on common vision. We can't get on common ground. And therefore, we can't move forward together. So we've got to have c good communication and common vision. Cooperation must be voluntary and it's got to be grateful. Grateful giving and grateful receiving. Should we be grateful to give? Absolutely. Be grateful to give. It's what gives us an opportunity to enlarge our own souls by giving to other people, by enlarging them. That's why love, trust, and cooperation must always be about both giving and receiving. If I give you a gift and I'm sincere and I care about you and you decide I am not receiving a gift from that person, how does it affect me and you both? It leaves question. It leaves distrust. I don't know why. Does it fulfill me? No, neither. By giving the gift, am I lifted? when you reject a sincere gift? Are you lifted when you reject my sincere gift? No. Nobody's lifted. They cannot be lifted at all. So it requires giving and receiving. Gracious, grateful, giving and receiving. This produces ever-increasing abundance of peace, freedom, and prosperity in the spirit of one for all and all for one. You know the old musketeer's motto? I love that motto. One for all and all for one. It means every individual looks to the good of everyone else around them and everyone else agrees we're going to look to the good of each individual around us. And that's what we need to have as our models of, of life in order to have love, trust, and cooperation. Here we have three levels of relationships. I'm going to put them all up. God is the first and the foremost. But we'll never mince words about that. Our relationship, our spiritual relationship with God as a Father in Heaven is our first and foremost relationship with every individual. If we don't have that as individuals, we will be crippled to that same extent in every other prioritized relationship that follows. Individual, marriage, family, extended family, friends and neighbors, I mean community, friends and neighbors, our, our community here, and then mankind generally. In that priority, we need all of those relationships. We deal with them all the time. And our relationship with God, number one, is what helps us keep all of them properly balanced. Now, what about atheists? Someone who does not believe there is a God, doesn't want to believe there is a God, no matter what. Can they still be benefited by the principles and values of the seven pillars? Yes. Yes. Absolutely can. Do we still love each other? Yes. Absolutely. Do we still cooperate together? Yes, we can. Whether an atheist wants to believe it or not, and I don't say this to be against that person, I love that person as much as any other. I believe in God, they may not. But, everyone who comes to truth is coming to God whether they know it or not. Because God is a God of truth. God is the author of truth. He is the originator of where that truth comes to us. That's my faith. So, if you don't believe in God, that's your, your choice. But if you come to truth, you're coming to God and you're coming to Christ. You mentioned in our last session, not everyone believes in Christ. But in my faith, if you believe in truth, you've already begun to come to Christ. Because He's the source in my faith. If you come to God our Father, source of truth. If you believe in truth, you've already begun to come to that same extent. If you allow truth to continue guiding you, it just might guide you to God. Okay? Now, the highest relationship priority is the spiritual with God. It gives us our greatest sense, our greatest sense, truest sense of self-identity. The second greatest relationship, or the highest priority, is our intrapersonal. That's right here, with me, inside of me, myself. How I feel about myself affects all relationships in my life. The way I can feel the very best about myself is to strengthen that relationship with God, that spiritual relationship. Number three, we obtain the greatest sense of self-worth and spiritual alignment with God by living in the seven pillars of love, trust, and cooperation. That's how we build ourself 
and any other relationship. Those are the principles and values that contain all truth and wisdom. Where did that, um, the, the seven pillars come from? And I'll put them all up here at the same time. Wow. Wisdom hath builded her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Seven pillars were inspired by Proverbs 9.1. One morning I woke up, took my shower, I was going to come out to read some scriptures for a while as was my routine. And on the, the master bedroom chair, my wife's scriptures were laying open. It was 6.30 in the morning. She was sound asleep in bed. I wondered, how did she, why did she get up to read scriptures? She's back in bed. But I thought, well, let's see what she's been reading. Picked it up and Proverbs 9.1 was the first verse I looked at. My wife later told me she had not been up. She didn't know why her scriptures were left open. <laughs> and this was five years after this whole project we're working on began to be inspired about Zion Life Foundation. And I could not get those seven pillars off my mind. When I read that verse, I realized, oh my heavens, those pillars are what God builds everything He does on. That's His foundation. God is wisdom, right? Interesting, he refers to this as a she. Wisdom hath built her house, right? Think about that one. We won't go into the details on that. <laughs> but it's very powerful when you start thinking about the symbolism and the relationship between that. Wisdom is built on the seven pillars. That means everything in the universe that God has created is built on those pillars. So how important is it? If God's foundation of these seven pillars... It's everything. There's no exceptions, right? The seven pillars are the governing principles of all truth, freedom, and wisdom. All personal growth, happiness, prosperity, problem solving, conflict resolution, addiction recovery, emotional stability. Oh my heavens. Seven pillars of peace and freedom. All life-changing, spiritual, secular principles, values, characteristics, and attributes are included within seven pillars categories. It doesn't matter where you go. All of these, all relationship problems and addictions can be identified and solved by using the seven pillars as keys to unlock their true reality. Now pay attention to those two words, true reality of a relationship problem. Okay, There are no exceptions in this. The true reality of a relationship problem always lies underneath. It's always what we cannot see. And if we're going to prepare for any time, not just now, but in the future, if we're going to be prepared to survive whatever challenges and oppositions we face, we must look at things in their true reality. Otherwise, we will pass through it in misery. <laughs> we will pass through it in instability. We must pass through it with a correct perspective. Every time you see one of these chains, every single time you see one of these chains, you see the opposite of the seven pillars, you must also recognize that the fruit of that chain is going to be a negative emotion. And it starts with a negative belief, a false belief. Which means all false beliefs produce negative emotions, negative results and effects every time. There's no exception to that, okay? I've worked with this for 25 years. There's never been an exception for 25 years I'm dealing with this. Examine it all you want. The problem with this is these all lie because they're all based in false perception, deception, misunderstanding. They all lie to us. And because they lie to us, we're, you're good people here. You don't want to be deceived. You don't want to be, believe something that's false. But if we believe it because we think it's true, if we believe it because we think it's justified, if we believe it because we have been taught all of our life, this is how you're supposed to respond in these circumstances. And the whole world is saying it. Well, it must be true, right? Wrong. Wrong. Just because more people are doing it doesn't make it right, doesn't make it true. In fact, in most cases, the more people are doing something negative, the greater it ought to say to us there's something wrong with it. There's something mistaken about it. Just because people all think that's right doesn't mean it's right. These are also mixed with the pillars. The chains, all negative thoughts, emotions, and behaviors are generated by powerful false beliefs that we believe are true or justified. Not just powerful, they are most powerful because they're hidden. They're hidden in our minds, in our hearts. We don't even know they're there. You can be five years old, 
pick up a, a false belief, not even know you've chosen it, but you have, because that's your right to choose it, and it will plague you for that false belief and, and produce negative results until the time you discover it and eliminate it. It will govern behavior. All beliefs govern behavior, without exception. Every time we behave in a negative way, every time our emotions come out in a negative way, every single time we have an, a fight with a spouse, every time we have a fight with our children or they with us, every time we hear about it in the news, in our community, in our world, it's always because there is false perception, false belief underlying it. And usually a whole chain of them. Every link representing a false belief. <clears throat> Change of the governing principles of deceit, <clears throat> dishonesty, misery, stress, anxiety, confusion, depression, hard-heartedness, hard frustration, conflict, and personal bondage, even premature death. Literally, they will lead us to a premature death because that's where they end. They end in death. They end in a finish. They do not lift and build. They bring to an end. They bring to destruction. That's their purpose in the end. All debilitating, crippling, counterfeit, and self-destructive principles and characteristics are included within the seven chain categories. Their nature and purpose is to weaken, deteriorate, and destroy life. All relationship problems are created and magnified by voluntarily blinding and enslaving oneself within the false realities and negative emotions generated by the seven chains. And there are no exceptions to that. False realities false realities because what does the world teach us today? Reality is what you make of it, what you want it to be. Truth is your own determination, your own identification, your own, <laughs> your own definition, whatever you want it to be. Is that true? No, it is not true. And it will lead you deeper and deeper into these chains. And that's the purpose of all falsehood, all false belief, all deceptions, is to lead you more into the chains, into greater conflict and bondage, taking from you peace, robbing from you freedom, robbing from you self-control. What is addiction? It is an absence of self-control, an absence of power and freedom to overcome chains. Chains of all different types. Chains which in every case are underlined by false belief. Every addiction is underlined by false belief. If you want to be ineffective and unhappy, just hold on to those chains. Don't let them go. If you want to be ineffective and happy, deny the power of the pillars. <laughs> deny it. Say, I don't need it. Be too proud, too close-minded, shut those eyes, stop up those ears and say, I'm going to hold on to these chains no matter what. I'm not even going to believe that they're chains. I'm not going to believe that I'm in chains. Keep doing that and you can be as unhappy as you want to be the rest of your life. How long do you want to do that? How long do you want to hold on to a grudge? a resentment, a bitterness. How long? I've known people who've held on to them for decades. Decades. Because why? It's comfortable. It's comfortable? Do you think they're comfortable being angry? Think about that. No, they're comfortable with their belief though. Okay. And it becomes habitual. Com now that's a very interesting word you're using. Comfortable with their belief? And it's an individual matter, you're right. They don't want to take responsibility for that feeling. Like they want to push it off on someone else. I know someone who has been, I, I can think of them right now, they've held this grudge for 20 years. They feel it is their responsibility, their duty, to hold that grudge, to not forgive. They believe that if they forgive that person, that person won't be punished enough. They believe that it's their duty to carry out the punishment, to be the judge, jury, executioner, and not to just execute them one time. <laughs> execute them over and over and over again sometimes. They believe it's a responsibility. Now as long as they believe in that as a responsibility, a duty, even an honor, 
how long will they hold on to that belief and carry it out? Who would hold that belief? This is the irony is, is incredible here. What kind of a person would hold on to that belief? Somebody who's deceived, somebody who's not self-confident, someone who doesn't have faith, someone who has a lot of pride, somebody who doesn't know where to go. <laughs> okay, so you you've just come off with a long string of, of, of reasons. I mean let me just tell you, they don't want to let go, yes. Someone who's deceived, yes. Someone who may or may not be uh, someone who is 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 willing to be kind or 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 confident or 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 hum humble. It, it it goes both ways. I will guarantee you this much, though. That person who holds on to that kind of a grudge for so long, for responsibility, duty, and honor's sake, is usually a person who believes they're an honest person. They generally believe they're a responsible person. They usually believe that they are servants of whomever they're holding the grudge on behalf of. <laughs> okay? You, there's all kinds of factions in the world, factions in marriages. Do you never see a marriage that's split into two different factions? <laughs> okay, the tactics in, in a marriage battle are no different than the tactics in, in a nation in a battle between nations, except they're not firing real nuclear weapons. They're just having a nuclear chain reaction in that marriage relationship, right? It's a chain reaction literally going on because they're flinging chains back and forth at each other, both based in false perception. Even the person who's right, if they're fighting and angry, is wrong. <laughs> okay? They have a mis misperception as to how they're supposed to deal with that. As to the best way to handle the situation. They don't understand. This program will teach you how to face those situations. It will teach you how to disarm the two sides. It will teach you to understand that in every case, it is always the wrong choice to go to the chains. They're never justified. These chains will never, ever be justified. Let's take a look at these next to one another. If I'm in pride and stubbornness, pride and stubbornness is probably the most subtle of all the chains. It's the first step to dishonesty. It is in denial of its own fault, its own weakness. Pride and stubbornness shuts off a mind it says I don't need help it stubbornly holds that ground it will not humble itself it will not admit that it needs to submit to something else to some other perceptive of truth pride and stubbornness is the most subtle because it is also what is the author of overconfidence a person who's been so successful for so long is the best candidate for drawing into self-righteous pride self-righteous pride can exist among the best of people the most devout, most diligent, <laughs> most dedicated to their faiths. That self-righteous pride causes that person to lift themselves up or to start changing their motives. They could have started out with the purest of humble motives in their service to mankind or to their faith. And by and by, because of recognition and glory, because they get such positive feedback from all the success they're having, from all the good that they're doing, their eyes get fixed on the good they're doing, and they don't notice. They don't notice that their motive for service is changing from selfless service to self-centered purposes or motives. Happens a lot. It's so much more common in the world than we realize. <clears throat> and it's blinding most to the person who is suffering it. And see, the chains are all blinding. If we look at all the symptoms of this, these chains, it's incredible what they do to be un ineffective and unhappy just hold on to those chains just hold on but if you want to be happy you want to learn how to identify them you want to learn how to see them for what they really are learn who you're fighting against these are who you're fighting it's, it's not your husband or your wife it's not your community it's not the nation it's the chains we're fighting it's the author of these chains that's the enemy we need to see each other as not the enemy okay we are brothers and sisters all of us all around the world we are brothers and sisters we're family of God we're humanity we are not each other's enemy we're only deceived into believing we're enemies but we're not we never should have been we're deceived and tricked into thinking that that's what we want to be need to be by honor duty responsibility jihad by radical Islam today not not the majority of Muslims today no the majority of Muslims today are peaceful people 
They want to be peaceful. I've got very good friends in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq. Very good friends that I've worked with internationally. They're peaceful, peace-loving people. It doesn't matter whether it's Muslim. It doesn't matter whether it's among Jews or Christians. It doesn't matter where we come from. There have always been people among those sects of religion or societies who choose to get wrapped up in the chains for one reason or another and do crazy things. To want to kill each other. It doesn't matter where you come from. And all through the millennia of this world's history, it's always been that way. So forget about their religions. Forget about the labels on their foreheads. What we have is a division between pillars and chains. Between people, generally, who are choosing the pillars and those who are choosing the chains, and why. Those who are choosing the chains, no matter where you come from, it's because they're deceived. Now that might offend some people. I will stand here and say it and stand my, stake my life on it. It's because they're deceived. They don't understand it. Many times they, they believe they're doing the right thing, fighting a holy war. And they want to take out a nation or a people or a person. To do terrorist activities around the world is chains. It's chains. And it's because that person believes they are duty bound to the responsibility of fighting that war for a belief that is mistaken. But is it just among a jihad? No, it can be in a marriage. It's the same tactics in marriage. It's the same tactics in any kind of a battle. The, the, idea, the idea is to take the opponent out, to beat them, to conquer them, to win the fight. And in doing so, we lose the relationship. In fighting that battle, we lose the relationship. We think the battle is so important that we throw away what is most important to try and win it when we choose the chains. What's most important is that we save that relationship. Now, we have about five minutes left in this session before we take a break. We go back to this, knowing how to unlock these chains. Identify them and unlock them. First, we have to identify that they exist, that they're present. Then we have to locate them, pinpoint them. And then we have to unlock them. To unlock them, you have to have truth. Truth unlocks all false perception, false belief. These are some differences in pillars and chains. If you'll just scan each side, these two columns on the, the left are all different characteristics, things up that are results of the of pillars. And on the right, chains. Look at the differences. These are products. Things that are produced from pillars and things that are produced from chains. It's powerful, it's totally opposites. The line down the middle is distinct. It's very distinct. We want to be choosing pillars because that's what solves all the problems. That's what creates growth. We're carrying all kinds of chains around. Lots of baggage. Lots of things that are slowing us down. That are wearing us out. Draining us of our energy. Don't carry the, the things. Forgive it. Choose to let it go. Release it. Lighten that load by living free in the pillars choosing peace. Choose to find the truth that will set you free. What side of the line do we want to choose? Pillars or chains? It's, it's an obvious answer. We all want pillars. We just have to figure out how to choose it, how to get out of those chains, how to identify and move on quickly here. Here's another dividing line. Positive side is in pillars. Negative side is in chains. Energy actually flows this way. Negative energy versus positive energy. Pillars create positive energy, strength. They empower us. They give us greater inspiration. They, they give us the, the groundwork to have ideas that come that normally wouldn't come to us. When we eliminate the chains, we eliminate the barriers that are, that are stopping us from getting greater inspiration. Everything starts with beliefs. Then it goes to thoughts. Then emotions. Then it goes to actions and then results. Everything, everything we do follows that cycle. We must learn to know what we believe. And if we have a chain, if we're feeling the emotions of that chain, we can know there's a misbelief somewhere underneath it. Perhaps a whole chain full of them. 
and there's an anchor at the bottom of that chain which is where it started where every single link attached to that chain began find that anchor kick it out and every link with it goes at the same time that we do all of our life and you become wiser and wiser stronger and stronger full of more and more light freedom personal empowerment and our relationships around us improve as we do it the next session we're going to be going into some problem solving we'll talk more about addiction we'll take a break here for a short time when we come back we're going to go through some detail on addiction and the problem solving process we use to help people solve general problems we also invite you to pick up a manual a study guide on the way if you don't have one already we'll invite you to please donate twenty five dollars that's half of what we normally ask it's for a conference special help us with the cause and the high tower project we talked about earlier in spreading the seven pillars and this lifestyle of love trust and cooperation around the world and drawing as many people to it as we can thank you very much we'll take a break here for about ten to fifteen minutes <laughs>